What do you make of the bounce we've seen in the last couple of sessions for stocks? Do you think it's sustainable? Um, <laughs> the true answer, I don't know. Um, I think we got a reprieve on yields a little bit. You know, the, the, the 10 to actually didn't close in inverted territory, so that may have calmed some fears. We know that there were some algorithmic triggers as a result of that intraday 10-2. So maybe the fact that we've moved out of it has things moving in the opposite direction. We're in a very momentum-driven short-term market. If you look at the factors that have been working, momentum has been working. It's been concentrated in the more defensive areas of the market, but it's momentum nonetheless. And then the one thing I can say is the breadth statistics in this latest couple of days look fairly decent. So, so maybe there's hope that this has some sustainability. And then lastly, I'd say the potential for additional tax cuts, whether it's feasible, whether it's going to happen, that might be a, a little bit of a bright light under stocks as well. Recent reports by you, uh, you, you said loss in the day-to-day -day trade-related volatility are longer-term concerns. What are they? Well, number one, I think it's amazing to me how little attention has been given to the pretty significant downward revision by the BEA to National Income of Products Accounts measure of corporate profits, which is a broader measure, of course, than S&P profits. And it came with the annual benchmark revisions uh, on July 26, when second quarter GDP was reported. And it was about a $200 billion downward revision to corporate profits, concentrated in the last three years. But as a result, we're now looking at a flat trend in corporate profits for the last five years, which also may help to explain, aside from the trade war, why capital spending has uh, rolled over and has been weaker than what many had hoped for, is because there's a high correlation between corporate profits and, and capital spending. And then the other thing, you just have to look at some of the deterioration in a few key leading indicators. I don't think we're looking at recession-type conditions right now, but we have to keep an eye on those leading indicators that are starting to see their trend deteriorate, which is maybe a first sign that you're going to eventually move into level deterioration. You, of course, see it in trend first before you see it in level. Hmm. Uh, Lizanne, I hear you talking about maybe tax cuts, light of fire. Uh, J.P. Morgan today says wait until September to buy because the earnings yields improving. I mean, I wonder, are, do you feel like the market is starting to grasp for reasons to buy? Um, I, the market clearly has been hanging on to uh, Fed rate cuts as a reason to to rally. Um, there, there's nothing wrong with Fed rate cuts. I think it provides an elixir for certain parts of the economy. I'm not quite sure it's a broad elixir for what ails us. I don't think what got our manufacturing part of the economy into the state that it's in right now or what's happening globally is a problem as a result of too high interest rates begging the question, OK, are lower interest rates going to be sufficient to offset some of those negatives? So far, we've seen the concentration of weakness in manufacturing. But there's a reason why manufacturing is a leading indicator. You tend to see deterioration first. So I do think we need to see some sort of pickup in manufacturing to have a hope that it's not going to eventually morph into the consumer side of the economy. Uh, so again, on the yeah. margin, there's nothing wrong with easier monetary policy, but I'm not sure that that's going to solve all that ails us right now. Lizanne, uh, experts are always telling individual investors not to be reactionary. And it, it strikes me that it's, we're about in the same place that we were at the beginning of August, uh, all of this volatility notwithstanding. So the investors who have been paying attention and have been wisely keeping their hands in their laps, perhaps, uh, what should they take away from all this movement? To what degree should it influence how they think about what the market's likely to do uh, over the medium term? Well, the reality is we actually haven't made much headway since January of 2018. So we're looking at about a 20 months of so lots of sound and fury, but we really haven't made much headway, not to mention the non-confirmation by things like the value line and, and transports and, and small caps. What our message has been, and this ironically is to some degree a message about reacting, but it's using rebalancing. So you're, you're reacting in adjusting your portfolio to what's been happening in the market. Rebalancing forces investors to do what we know we're supposed to, which is buy low, sell high, or add low, trim high. When left to our own devices, we often tend to do the opposite. But rebalancing, when you're seeing greater dispersion across asset classes, when you're seeing these bigger moves, not just on an intraday basis, but uh, like I said, going back 20 months or so, we've just seen these big swings, your portfolio is going to tell you when it's time to do something. So if your domestic equity exposure kind of gets out of whack, you're out over your skis, let your portfolio tell you it's time to pair that back. And to use a trader yeah. term, it keeps investors on the right side of the trade. And that's the closest thing you get to a free lunch in any environment, certainly in one like this.